The Commonwealth Tonight Studio Show starts right now. Looking back at day three of the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. And uh, this is a 22nd edition of uh, the Commonwealth Games. It's called Birmingham 2022. Nicholas Paul, the outstanding TNT cyclist, looked on track for gold today. He had to sell for the silver though, but that still beefed up the TNT medal tally to two and the overall Caribbean medal tally to three. Uh, our guests at the moment are uh, Anil Roberts, our standard guest on the Commonwealth Tonight Show. He's a former sports minister in Trinidad and Tobago, outstanding swimming coach. He was a fairly good footballer in his days, an outstanding swimmer, I might add. And beside him, we have Leighton Levy, our Sportsmax.tv um, chief editor. And uh, let's look at that medal table quickly now. The Aussies have been dominant in the medals most of the Commonwealth Games in history. Um, since 1990, they've only lost the medal table once, and that was 2014 in Glasgow. And you see there, they're already making their mark on this year's uh, event. Trinidad and Tobago moving up to 11th in the table now with one gold and one silver medal. And uh, the Bermudans are in 12th at the moment with their Flora Duffy gold medal in her triathlon. Yeah, so as we said, today didn't go as well as a lot of us expected as Caribbean viewers of the Commonwealth Games here on the Sportsmax broadcast family. And uh, Nicholas Paul, after his impressive run in the key run yesterday, looked impressive, Leighton and uh, Anil, in the prelims of the men's sprint today. In fact, a games record 9.445 in the prelims of the sprint, but was outrun in the final by the determined Aussie. Well, very interesting. Let me first of all say, silver is silver. Congratulations. Yes. We're proud. Yes. But then you have to go into the coaching element and say, listen, we were the fastest. What happened? Gold was a higher probability than silver. But when we saw, we, it's a multitude, a myriad of reasons now. In the final, what took place? The, if there is one weakness that we have seen so far, but he's young, in Nicholas Paul, it's the, the savvy, the mentality for technique, tactics, and, and so on. He's, he doesn't have all those years under his belt. No, that's okay. He's improved since Tokyo. He showed it in the Karen. He didn't get boxed in. He went early and so on. But in the final, the Australian had a plan. They must have looked and they understood what Nicholas Paul was. And he took him out of his comfort zone. He zigzagged. He had him changing his eyes, changing yes. his line of sight. Yeah. He took him and he took him on a crazy run. Yeah. All right. Well, well. before we get into the in-depth analysis of what, mm -hmm. what happened, because you have already started to dissect the event, mm -hmm. Anil, let's take a look at what happened today. It was a tremendous ride. And even into the last lap, you thought that Nicholas Paul, as he did in the prelims, would have shot past Matthew Richardson and taken the gold medal. But the Aussie wasn't for catching. One critical mistake at the wrong moment for Nicholas Paul, capitalized on brilliantly by Richardson last time out. But this time the table's turned. Richardson's on the front. We're just trying to force uh, Nicholas Paul to come through to the front. Not able to do so on that occasion. This time. Mm. Nearly. Nearly. Paul drops down now. Just eases up. Looks back into the room, the Australian. Richardson looking the wrong way. Looking the wrong way. Looking around, finds him there on the right side. Paul's got a bit of height to work with here, tries to rush in. Committing to this move. Richardson with a bag leg for advantage and the inside line takes the bell. Paul having to go the wrong way round. And Paul losing contact here. Richardson holding off the man for Trinidad and Tobago and he's beaten him. Richardson takes gold. Paul Silva. The Aussie has done it. He broke Paul there with a ride all oh, brilliant. That is a gold medal he will never forget. Doesn't matter what happens for the rest of his career. Up a 
fabulous performance from Nicholas Paul, but lessons nonetheless. Yeah, so Nicholas Paul with the silver there in the men's sprint, and as we had said in the prelims, he went a games record 9.445. Um, Leighton, I'm going to get your, your view on this too, because even with the commentary, you listen to the commentary, and the commentator was genuinely shocked that Nicholas Paul didn't win that gold medal. Yeah, I think what Ali was on to something earlier. I think it's a lack of experience at this level with the kind of performance because you saw the, sav the, the savviness of the of the Australian here. And I think he learned from this because clearly he's one of the best cyclists in the world. Yeah. But there are sometimes you have these little weaknesses that will come to come to the fore because your opponents are breaking you down each phase of the way and know exactly how to get the better of you. And I think that's what happened here. But no shame on Paul. Outstanding performance nonetheless. Yeah, gold and silver so far, and he still has more sprint events to come, Anil. But I wanted I want to ask you this quickly. Do you think overconfidence played a part in what happened today? No, not at you all. I think so, yeah. What what happened is uh, let me go quickly. Yeah. That was the second ride. Okay, he lost two straight rides. Yeah. The first ride, the Australian was behind and he shattered him and took him uh, and had him looking and changed. And when he, he caught him glancing to the outside, he got no, in no, on the inside cool. line and that was all over. It was a close race. He came back around. That race that you saw, there was a second one. And when he got up to go, he was not as sharp as we saw in the first rounds. Now, what has happened? He had three carrying rounds. In his semi final Final of the match sprint, he got uh, relegated and disqualified from one, so he had a third ride. He's also been riding harder, Lance, because of the Olympics, where he got boxed in and never got the chance to show his speed. He's been going earlier. What does this do? Every time you fire and you get that bike going, you tear muscle fibers, so then your recovery uh, starts to happen. So as you ride more, you get less explosive. So the commentators, myself, you would have thought he would have gone around here. Yeah. If this was yesterday, he's gone. Mm -hmm. He's flying. But because of the euphoria of the gold medal, the tiredness, the extra riding, the extra pedaling, the extra runs, he is not as fast as he was when he landed. So recovery, science, massage, therapy, sleep, nutrition very important also, but great ride from the australian also though the australian kept him on the outside i mean mm -hmm. it's like track and field you push him on the outside you're running yes. going a little bit farther each time yeah. it's harder to catch up and close that gap yeah. and, it, and it, the build-up for nicholas paul to the commonwealth games and it wasn't completely smooth he suffered a fractured collarbone in may competing at the uci nations cup in glasgow um it was considered a minor fracture, so he had always been confident that he would be back in time for the Commonwealth Games. In fact, he won a UCI meet in early July mm -hmm. to Correct. show that he had, get, he had gotten himself back. Would that break in Correct. competition mm -hmm. also be a factor well, in him not being able to complete this double? With an, with an athlete like that, what you're talking about yeah. is when you plan their, their training, you have to do your base work. So even though he's a pure out-and-out -out sprinter, you have to get his aerobic capacity up because to recover between rounds, just like a sprinter, you know, like if you're running 200, 100 rounds are, are easy because you have that fitness and you're able to recover. So when you get a little injury and your aerobic capacity goes down because you cannot do the kind of work you want, the recovery process from 100% efforts takes a greater toll on you. And that's what we see. Because in that last sprint, we all thought with two more drive. I think also I'm not a technical person with the bike. But I think because he, his muscle fibers were a bit torn, they should have gone down in a gear. When he went in that second ride, he could not turn the gear like he did the day before because he didn't have that explosive power. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if we could have gone down a little gear so that he could have generated that pace to catch up and to go around the Australian. But the Australian take nothing from him. Yeah. When you see a man faster than you, you know a man faster than you, you figure it out and you implement it. I must say kudos to the Australian rider and their coach, their management team. They took one from us. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Richardson, well done, the Aussie. Uh, he rode with a lot of determination and guts to fend off Nicholas Paul I'm because smart. any lesser rider would have uh, crumbled under the pressure that Nicholas Paul would have been putting, putting on him. Now, I have always spoken about the level of infrastructure and facilities 
that Trinidad and Tobago has put into its sports program. There are other things that I'm sure Anil isn't, isn't happy about, but you, <laughs> you, you can't fault them for their fabulous velodrome, Anil. They, the velodrome is reputed to be one of the best in the Western Hemisphere, Hemisphere. and the, the, the proliferation of outstanding cyclists coming through from TNT at the moment, very, very impressive. Akeem Campbell, he was competing today in the 15K scratch event, and he fell. It looked a very, very scary moment. The, the Antiguan uh, Jamie Bridges also fell in the same incident, but he got himself up and continued to compete and in the end qualified for the, the next round. There he's falling, but he wouldn't give up here. He rejoined the race and um, got into a top 10 position that actually qualified for the next round. So good on him there. But just a word on the outstanding cyclists that TNT uh, would have been producing in recent times. I remember Jusain Philip, who was just a whisker away from a medal at the London 2012 Olympic Games. But Akeem Campbell showed a lot of guts today, Anil. Not only guts, he's brilliant. Now, that, that fall is relatively a calm fall because you're not sprinting. In the second semi-final of the Kerrin the English rider and Australian had a crash at, at about full 70, a full tilt, 74 miles yes. per hour. And the English rider was like knocked out for a little while. So, but to get back up, clamp back your boots into that and to ride and qualify shows a sort of determination and a will to represent your country that must be respected. Akil Campbell was brilliant. He could have easily decided, well, that's it. You know, I'm out. He got up, he rode, he fought back. Very proud of him late then. Absolutely. And when you when you when you train for such a long time to come to a major event like the Commonwealth Game, you want to give it your all. So even with mishaps like this, you're not willing to give up because you worked too hard to get there in the first place and it's another four years again. So you 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 dig down deep and find that that stuff, that grit that allows you to get to these performances and outstanding outstanding comeback from the young man. Yeah, I want to say that coming out of those qualifiers as well, the Grenadian uh, Red Waters also qualified for the next stage of the 15K uh, scratch event and uh, a good show there by the Grenadian in uh, the cycle event. Just before we go to the break and come back to talk some cricket, there was some 3-on-3 three three basketball today. TNT, your team, 0-3 oh now in uh, the basketball pool bottom of the table after losses to Australia, England, and New Zealand. But as I talk, I talk basketball, Bill Russell, NBA legend, 88 years old, died today. I'm not sure if any of you guys are, are Celtic fans, but he is considered one of the greatest players ever in the game. Well, I didn't even hear that, so condolences. I'm not a Celtic fan. Oh, you I'm are. a Laker fan, so yeah. I really <laughs> yes. despise the Celtics. You but despise Bill, them, yes. But not... not uh, Bill, Bill Russell, Russell. Yes. he won with uh, Red Auerbach. I think they won 12 titles straight. He was he a man, uh, a black man, a tall black man in a time when black men weren't allowed much freedom. And even though he was a champion in Boston, Boston nightclubs and restaurants and treated him, he was one of them who got together with uh, Jim Brown yes. and, uh, and Muhammad Ali yes. to fight for civil rights well, he, and he so on. He walked with Martin Luther King Ma as well. walked with Martin yeah. Luther King. He was not only a great athlete, yeah. but a man who uplifted his community. So condolences yeah. to the world because yeah. he was the first global star. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and to add to that, he was the man who actually made him start recording blocks. Yeah. You remember back in the 1950s, the first time he blocked the ball, they called it goaltending. Yes. So he's helped to transform the game yes. and has been an inspiration to many of the modern stars today. And he yeah. will be missed. He was actually a really great, uh, not just a great athlete, yes. but a great human being as well. Yeah, a record 11-time champion in the NBA and was actually a player coach, I think, for the last two times yeah. that the a Boston manager. Celtics were champions. Bill Russell, dead at age 88, a true colossal giant of American sport. When we come back on Commonwealth tonight, we talk cricket and the Barbadians running into a mountain today in the world number one, Australia.
We're back on the Commonwealth Tonight Studio Show, looking back at day three of the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham City. It's Birmingham 2022. It's the 22nd staging of the Commonwealth Games, and the Australians are out front in the medal table as well. And uh, that is customary. Let's see if anyone can topple them from the top spot. Certainly Barbados tried today in women's T20 cricket and were unsuccessful. Barbados losing this one by nine wickets. Australia winning with 71 balls to spare. And uh, the Barbadian team led by Haley Matthews, the new West Indies captain, coming off their huge win over Pakistan, finding the Aussies too hot to handle. Barbados 64 all out. Matt Matthews getting 18, the top score. Alana King 4 for 8. That's a leg spinner. Talia McGrath, a medium pacer. 3 for 13. Ashley Gardner picked up 2 for 6 as well. And the Aussies in reply 68 for 1. Meg Lanning 36. Alyssa Healy 23. And uh, Shanika Bruce taking the only Barbados wicket 1 for 7. The Australians winning with 71 balls to spear. Now, I don't think there are many people that expected Barbados to beat Australia. But the 9 wicket victory, the 6 to 4 all out, and the win with 71 balls to spear is a little bit much. And uh, the Barbadians would have been disappointed Leighton, that uh, they weren't able to give the Aussies more of a challenge. Right. And the line was sitting here last night. I said, Barbados had a puncher's chance of winning this game, but they had to bring their A game. They had to bat, play smart cricket. They had to bat well. well primarily because, look, you have DeAndre Dotton, you have Haley Matthews, you have Kaisia Knight. One of those three, at least one of those three, had to fire today. <laughs> And it started out well. Went without loss, 3.5 overs. <coughs> Haley Matthews just hit a couple of fours. And then went for an inexplicable shot that got her out and then started the rot. Deandra Dutton, very careful. I think she got one of the first 12 balls. And then played across the line to the spinner, which did make sense to me. But then again, it's, it's, it's indicative of what we've seen from West Indies teams over the years. Kaisia Knight, first ball from McGrath, pulls a ball down to backward square, gets caught. And then after that, it's a procession. Haley Matthew was the only, only batter today in double figures for, for Barbados in a team that had potential to score a lot more. I'm not saying that they would have beaten Australia had they batted better, but 64 all out was a completely disappointing performance. Yeah, the Barbadians have seven players in their team that play for the, the West, West Indies. And Anil... We can talk a little bit more about the technical aspect of the game, but from a coaching standpoint and the sort of mental preparation that they would have focused on for this assignment, because it was a colossal test. As I said, Australia were heavy favorites to win, and Australia is the superior team. But what, in your estimation, were you the Barbados coach, would you have done setting yourselves up, setting your team up for a challenge against a team as strong as the Aussies? No. Hindsight is 2020. So I'm talking from a position of advantage, having seen the capitulation of yeah. talented players. And my analysis would say that, especially in a team sport, sometimes as coaches, you talk a good game. But if there is doubt that trickles in to one player, let's say they're not getting the message that we are good, we are capable, we're going to take them. They believe it 92%. But when you multiply that out amongst that 8% deficit across 11 players and over 20 overs, it's a lot of doubt and it creeps in. And then when things go bad, when your, your star gets out or a bad shot or wickets fall, there will be a mental collapse. That's what we saw. It's one game. I am not impressed, but I'm also still heartened by the potential that Barbados chose. So the coach now has to stitch up those wounds because those wounds of that beating that shellacking are serious wounds and if you don't talk it out tonight two hours listen forget it we we collapse that's all right we are still good we still have a plan we have another game to go put this out of your minds completely mm -hmm. and let's move forward we will get better as we go on yeah they play india on yeah. wednesday that's their next game and their final game in the group um, India ranked number four in the world. Not as good as the Aussies, but still favorites to beat, to beat the Barbadians. Well, I would say 
that Barbados with the talent and the potential that they have and the focus now, you go back to your first game when you went with Pakistan. Yeah. You have to reinstill that faith and confidence. Their confidence, each player's confidence would have taken a beating. So the coach, the management now has to come and start to be believe, start to build them back up. Whether it is emotionally about playing for Barbados, whether it's team-wise, chemistry-wise, and individually in the task at hand and focus on India and they can win and progress. Yeah. Leighton, I've heard you in the past assessing West Indies cricket and cricket in the Caribbean overall, questioning the coaching and the drills that our players go through. It is a known fact that West Indies players at all levels appear to struggle against good spin bowling. Mm -hmm. Now, Alana King, the leg spinner, picked up four wickets today. Um... Ashley Gardner, the off spinner, picked up two, two, four, six. They were responsible for removing four of the top six Barbados batters, which suggests that they ripped out the the, the, the heart of the Barbados batting. Um, how weak were they today against the spinners? Very. I mean, look, this is a pitch that had no devils in it, okay? The grassy pitch, there was some turn, but not prodigious turn to suggest that you can't, it's like, you know, chain one kind of turning on a pitch. The fundamentals of the game are lacking, I find. Shot selection, playing with a straight bat. You don't play across the line to, like Deandre Dotton today. The ball pitching in line with the stumps and you're sweeping. That's a risky shot for a shot that would not likely get many runs because there was somebody at backward point. Uh, you know, so you're, you're looking at a situation, not backward point, backward arm, um, square or fine leg in that, in that region. So you're, you're taking up, you're playing a high risk shot for low reward. Some of these fundamentals are, is, are the lack of these fundamentals. There's things that are endemic right throughout the West Indies. From, because I don't think from a grassroots level, they've been taught the fundamentals. They're actually learning the thing when they're playing for the West Indies, when they're learning how to bat against certain types of bowling. And that can't, that's not ac acceptable. You should be able to master that. So the adjustments that you make at this level should be minor as opposed to major. When you're playing against to, quality spinners. To enhance that point, Lance, it's, yes. it's similar to your children. You're disciplining your children at home. You're a stern father. You have a system or, and or every mother. day. Or mother. Yes, yes. Right? I'm, I'm definitely or mother. <laughs> and you have, uh, you're, you're firm and you're controlled every day and consistent. You don't know that your children have grasped the principles of courtesy, respect, and discipline until you let them go outside and you take yourselves away. So that is in this cricket. You've taught the girls. We're in the change room already. We're practicing in the net. But now the bright lights are on and the number one team, one of the best teams in the world between Australia and England is coming at you. And we realized that we didn't really know what we thought we knew. Yeah. You know what? I, I thought about the Aussies' attitude going into this game. And we know how the Aussies are. We saw how Matthew Richardson approached Nicholas Paul today. He knew that, and his coach would have known that Nicholas Paul is a genuine top man. So we've got to tackle him head on. They would have seen Haley Matthews and Deandra Dottin as the kind of players who could threaten them. Dottin went for 25 runs in the one over she bowled. So it was almost as if the Aussies came for the top guns in the Barbados team and put them under pressure early. Yeah, because here's the thing. There's a stat that the commentators mentioned today that I'm sure the Australian players knew. Yeah. Alana King against Deandre Dutton, the last nine times they've faced each other, yeah. she's gotten her wicket. Yes. Right? These are the things that the Australians know and they work on because they break down the team. So are you they... suggesting that West Indies coaches don't do that? I don't think they do because I'm sure they do. I, I'm sure they if do. they do, the players don't forget, don't, don't remember that information when they get to the field. Because yes. I've always maintained you practice the way you practice is how you play. Yes. If you practice poorly, you will play poorly, and we've seen that across the board in the West Indies. Let me also add, you can only be an upset start uh, Cinderella team once. You came out and you thrashed Pakistan. Australia was watching. Yes. Yes. So any thought of overconfidence and so on went out the window yes. after the first 10 overs of the first game. Yes. So they got serious, they got focused, and they said, hey, we're not going out there to be embarrassed by any one small island team. We are coming there. They focused. They thought, do we do that as a West Indies team and as a unit? 
We do it. But <clears throat> is it as effectively done as the other team? Okay, well, let's see what Barbados will do against the Indians on Wednesday. It's an opportunity to finish number two in the pool that they are playing in. Well, the Jamaica rugby men had problems in the group stages, <laughs> 0 and 3, without scoring in all of their three games. But in the 13th to 16th playoff, they got a couple of wins today, and we'll talk about that after the break. Yes, and we are back with the Commonwealth Tonight Show and uh, discussing what happened on day three of the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham today. And uh, one of the events that the Caribbean competitors were involved in would have been men's rugby. Now, the Jamaica Crocs, as they call them, had a torrid time in their pool matches. They lost 62-0 to Australia, 42-0 to Kenya, and uh, 42 or 45-0 to Kenya, and 40-0 uh, to Uganda. So they lost all three of their pool games, so they were relegated to the playoffs, 13th to 16th. Won their games today against Malaysia and Sri Lanka, defeating Malaysia fairly comfortably and then getting a tight 28-24 victory over the Sri Lankans. I know Anil Roberts and uh, my co-presenter George Davis have had a running battle <laughs> over the performance of the Jamaica rugby team. So, with their two victories today, Anil, they um, fin 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 <laughs> finishing, finishing 13th, finishing 13th in the 16-team field, mm. um, any, any redemption in your, in your not mind? A, not a little bit, and I don't know what George calling me for. I'm happy. <laughs> okay, let me talk the positives first. I'm happy they didn't come last, yes, okay? Yes. But I was thinking about what to say and how to get it across to the people. It was like, you know, since I see Lance and George and Leighton looking fit, Leighton dropped about 47 pounds since Tokyo Prime. I said, listen, I am a coach. I'm closer to church further from God. I need to exercise. Yeah. So I said, let me go in Pegasus Gym and Pegasus Great Service Hotel in Jamaica. Yeah. I said, let me start to exercise, Lance. Yeah. So when I go on the treadmill, I take out my phone and I look for some soca music. Yes. And the first thing that jump up is some fella who used to be, maybe have Caribbean roots, but also right. I don't know what it is, but yeah. I just press play. Yeah. And the soca sound good, but he is kind of yankee eyes he's foreign but the soca still sweet because i love all soca yes i go down while i'm on the treadmill and i see dj anna from trinidad and tobago and she has a soca mix call sunglasses and soca and she in the pitch lake and so on and when i put on her mix i see brilliance better choice selection faster mixing um, dub plate in between, real soak, and the vibe just went up. Yes. And that's what I'm saying. Them fellas who outside there, who ain't live here, yes. who ain't eat no ackee and sailfish, who ain't eat no doubles, who ain't go and swim down in the river and go and eat jerk chicken, they may understand what it means to be Jamaican. So them outside, you put together a team, and they are not very impressive. And what we need to do, is understand that you need your Jamaican culture, your Jamaican brilliance, your Jamaican attitude in a sevens rugby, and you can beat the best in the world within a short space of time. I do not, and I'm not impressed with coming, not coming last. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so are you suggesting then, well, one of two things, that Jamaica shouldn't have sent a team there because you don't think that sh they should have used these overseas Jamaicans who were not, trained for rugby in jamaica and don't have the jamaican culture for the game well let me put it this way if you if you're in a quali i would have said don't play the qualifier because if you don't know what you're sending yeah. jamaican sport is a brand trinidad and tobago sport is a brand yeah. barbados that's why i get upset when i see my net wall we'll talk about that yeah. but jamaica has a brand puma people jamaica fashion became a brand from sport brilliance you cannot represent a brand like that 
the way that they did in the rugby sevens. I'm very sorry. Yes. It's not a development meet. It's not a jokey game. It's not let's go and drink beers after. Yes. So if you are going to take a team that doesn't understand the brand, then I blame the administrators for not teaching them, not bringing them home to yes. understand and the selection process. I'm happy they won two games, but a, an exciting r race could be me against Leighton in 100 meters. Both of us will run like 16.6. It will be deadly slow, but we will lean on the tape and it will be exciting. Yes. But we won't be fast. Yeah. Anil, uh, is uh, Anil. Uh, all right, let me, go, let me ask Leighton. Is, is, is Anil making any sense here? Because the, the pool games were, were pretty horrible, to, to say the least. 62 nil to Australia, 45 nil to Kenya, 40 nil against Uganda. Is Anil Roberts, Leighton Levy, making sense? I, I, I get his point. I understand completely where he's coming from. Mm. Um, you know, the, if you don't lose, you don't get blanked three games in a row. Because that's not the Jamaican mentality. There's a, there's, a, there's a warrior spirit among our sportsmen and women that seem lacking in, in these three games. I don't know if that's the cause of it. But I, I take his point. I mean, I, I can completely... You know, really to what he's what he's saying. Yeah, saying. yeah, I, yeah I, th I think George's point today was well. They defeated Malaysia twenty-eight seven. They defeated Sri Lanka twenty-eight twenty-four. So should they feel proud that they were able to rebound from the pool disaster? And, well, Lance, uh, and, they did and, not, and they did not rebound. They just played people who were lambs to the slaughter. When is the last time? The sevens game of rugby is pure speed and power. Jamaica's brand is speed and power. When you see Jamaica's netball woman, you're seeing speed, fitness, and power. When you see Jamaican track and field, you're seeing speed, fitness, and power. You see the Jamaican woman football team, you're seeing speed, fitness, and power. You went against... When is the last time you saw a Sri Lankan other than the girl who was in the 2000 Olympics <laughs> run fast? When is the last time you see a Malaysian run fast and be powerful? My mother is a Malaysian. I is a half Malaysian. And I slow like molasses. When I play football, <laughs> I had to use my brain to try and create space and so on, Lance. I'm very sorry. Next time, improve. The way to improve is to be honest with yourself. That was a horrendous performance. It was not worthy of the colors of Jamaica. If you want to go in four years, understand that. Start from base level. Do what is right and get out there. I'm not saying you have to go and beat uh, Australia or beat South Africa. But give but us not, a not 62 love. No, not yeah. love. Love, no, no, love no. is good for Jamaica on the beach and so on, you know, not, not on a field. Mm. The only uh, caveat to, to what Anil is saying is yeah. that at least they've come away with a couple of wins. Huh? Yes. So that's at least something they can take away from that experience and say, okay, fine. But, but, then, you, know, but you have to build on that. Yeah. You have to do the work to get to And that don't level. get me wrong. I'm not only, this is not only for Jamaica. Yeah. Because for them to qualify, that means they beat Trinidad and Tobago. They beat Barbados. They beat Guyana. And so so the, all that I am saying here goes to all of us. Because we worse than them. Mm. <laughs> I, 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 I hear you. I hear you. Well, you, you because just, how they qualify, lands? They had to beat me? Yeah, they had to, really? beat, they, they had to go through some, some qualifying um, procedures. Well, when we come back from the break, we are going to continue talking some swimming this time. A lot that the huge percentage of the Caribbean uh, competitors fail to make semis or finals. Let's see if Annie Roberts has an issue with them as well, because <laughs> that's his sport. Swimming back in a moment. <laughs> Back with the Commonwealth Tonight, Commonwealth Tonight studio show. Looking back at what happened on day three of the Commonwealth Games being staged in Birmingham City. It's called Birmingham 2022. Actually, the 22nd staging of the Commonwealth Games. And we have looked at some of the events that the Caribbean athletes took part in already today, including cricket and uh, rugby. 
We are now ready to talk some swimming, which is the most specialized area of our esteemed guest, Anil Robert, who coached Leah Martindale to a fifth place finish at the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, and uh, coach Martindale and Siobhan Copper, the Trinidadian, to multiple world championship finals and so on. So his heart is close to swimming, and that's where we're going to start. Dylan Carter, the Trinidadian, who missed out on a medal in the, his men's sprint event yesterday in the Butterfly, uh, competed today and uh, finished fourth in his, uh, well, he finished fifth in his heat, qualified for the semis, didn't contest the semis. Uh, Devante uh, Carey from the Bahamas competed. He had also qualified. Uh, Maddie Moore from Bermuda, she competed in the women's 50 fly and she uh, reached the semis as well. Uh, your take overall, starting with Dylan Carter, on what happened for the Caribbean swimmers today. Yes, well, uh, Ricardo Chambers on uh, Sportsmax is doing some fantastic interviews. And last night, while we were here on Commonwealth Tonight, we listened to the interview. And Dylan Carter said that he was going to just swim the heats and then scratch. Uh, because his 50 fly was his greatest chance to get up on the podium to try to win gold. It's just that he wasn't physiologically ready. So he went here and you could see normally if Dylan Carter is at his best, when he breaks out there at 14 meters, he, he was in a slight lead, but he would have been chest. His chest would have been ahead of even the, the fastest swimmers in lane four because off the blocks, Dylan Carter is the second best starter in the entire world. The only man who can start and get to 15 meters faster than him off the blocks is the big American who is just unbelievable, right? And so Dylan Carter scratched. He gave the Bahamas carry an opportunity to swim. He swam well, uh, but his stroke at this level, he has a limitation. His right arm overreaches. Now, when you overreach, you see in the backstroke, the backstroke is a little bit different from butterfly and freestyle in that you need stroke rate. You need your arms to turn over at a fast rate. Some of those guys are swimming at a rate of 80 cycles per minute, whereas the Bahamas carry, he, because his arm overreaches, there is a pause between here and there. He was out in lane eight in the semifinal that his stroke, his arms cannot generate the rate necessary to get up and to compete against the fastest swimmers in the world. So he did a good time. He had a solid swim. But you've got to correct the technique in swimming or else you're just going to be working hard and swimming the same time over and over and over again. Yeah, and um, the fact that he pulled out of his semifinal assignment does suggest, as you, you touched on just now, that he wants to give himself a better chance to do something in an event coming up to save his energy. And you're suggesting that the freestyle 50 meter yes. will be his next best opportunity the for, 50, for Russia to medal. The, yes, the 50 freestyle is his only other chance. Okay, Dylan Carter is extremely talented. If he's prepared properly for a games like this or world championships or Olympics, he can do well in the 100 freestyle, the 100 backstroke. The 50 backstroke, the 100 fly, the 50 fly, and the 50 freestyle. Uh, now he's on the wrong end of the taper, meaning he had focused on the world championships in Budapest from June 17th to 25th. They'd made an error and they have not maintained his power output, his anaerobic threshold, which is the about the, 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 the aerobic level that goes down. We're hearing this on here, so I hope you're hearing me still. But his, it came down too low, and therefore he cannot recover fast. So he doesn't have a lot of, of energy left in the tank, and uh, we'll have to take a break to get his TV off because we aren't <laughs> sure what's going on. So he had to, he had to, I hope you all were hearing me. Yeah. He has to conserve what he has. Yeah. He's a tremendous athlete, and he wants to fight he wants to get up there. He wants to get on the podium so bad. Yeah. I saw the disappointment on his face when he spoke with Ricardo yesterday, Anil, because it was very obvious that he 
knew he could have gone faster. He has a personal best in, in the in the fly at 2280, and his time was 23 plus. So he was, you know, like two tenths of a second off what he knows he can do. And I saw I saw the disappointment mm-hmm. in his body language and his speech. One thing you, you, you see, and especially in swimming, when you check swimming and you check this, the scholarship athletes, for example, in the USA, you would see that swimmers, they, they, their grade point average is also highest across all sports. Swimming has a way from a young age of, of inculcating discipline, ability, and it crosses over into ac- academics. What does that do? That makes athletes who are swimmers very intelligent. So you're coaching. You can't be one of those coaches who says, it's my way or the highway. You have to explain what, what, what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what benefits will come. So Dylan Carter is a student of the game. He's well experienced from the first race. Yes. And when you heard Ricardo Chambers interviewing him, he said, well, I didn't. He said, I wanted to go in the semifinals, but I didn't feel the pop. He knows that what that pop is. He knows that it, he's a little short of strength and power. Yes. So therefore, he won't be able to get down to his medal winning times. But he's still there to fight hard. Yeah, there is a 200 meter butterfly race, which, which you want to yes. analyze and make a point about. But quickly before we do that, Keenan Doles, one of the top Jamaican swimmers, competed today. He was the best Caribbean swimmer, I think, in his event that yeah. he went in. But he didn't, he didn't advance to the semis. You're close to the swimming people in Jamaica, uh, Leighton. Uh, what's your report card on what the Jamaicans have done in the pool so far? <laughs> it's hard to gauge because I think we've seen the teams, the, the swimmers progress over the past few years to the point where you thought they would have been better at these championships. But apparently something, there was some disconnect, I, I believe, between last year at the CC Can and this year where the progression was not linear. Yes, And I think what we're seeing across the board here is the downside of that non-linear progression. So I think maybe coming into next year, the seasons coming into next season, I think we'll probably see them start to t- move upward again. But it's Keenan didn't do badly today. Yeah, I think he was fifth in his heat. Yeah. And I wasn't the time wasn't terrible. It was actually a pretty solid time as well. But I think that's where all of the Jamaican swimmers primarily have been this season where it's, it's been like a sine wave, where you're not quite sure what to expect um, coming into these championships. Yeah. And they, it, it, it follows that, it's been following that trend. Yeah, I think he was 13th fastest in, mm. his, in the overall uh, rating when the uh, times were tabulated. Now, um, Andy Roberts has a point to make about something he saw in the men's 200-meter butterfly today. Uh, the South African, 29 years old, tackling a young field and showing a lot of bravery. And uh, there are some points that uh, Anil wants to make on his performance. Uh, let's look at that event now. Chad Leclerc, the South African, uh, battling courageously for a silver. Yes, well, the audio should be down. And here you have Chad Leclerc in a final. Now, this is a man who's won Olympic gold, world championship gold. He has a bag of medals. But he has come to this competition woefully out of shape. He's on the verge of, of retiring. And he knows... That everyone nearly in this heat, at least five swimmers, are faster, are fitter than him. But I am showing you this just like Akil Campbell did when he fell down and he got back up and he got he and he used his mind and his passion for his country to get out there. Now Chad Leclo is in the front there. He is at in the lead. But his stroke has already begun to shorten, which means the lactic acid is already building up. And we, the piano is already dropping on his back <laughs> with another two lengths to go. But this man is so mentally strong, so powerful, and, de- and his desire to get up on the podium is so huge that... You're saying here that although he's leading, he's yes. already tired. He's already tired. Look at the jerk now. His head starts to jerk. His arms are shortening. He's getting red. You can see the blood building up and, and coming to the skin. He is absolutely shattered. And there's still 60 meters to go. Really and truly, if he is mentally weak, every single swimmer should fly past him on this last length. He takes a deep breath. 
He's in so much pain that he could probably pass out now. And he's kicking. Look at the head jerking. He's fighting. He said, listen, forget technique. Let me look across. Out wide is James Guy who went to Millfield School, the same school I went to in Somerset, England. He's been a medalist at the Olympics and World Championship. Here comes the young guy fit. But look at this man, Chad Laclau. He's doing anything he can to scrap and scrape and get his hand to the wall. That is the most painful thing. I have ever seen and that's what sport is about that's what you do that's how you fight and he got a silver man he's going to feel that pain next week <laughs> <laughs> so the New Zealander Lewis Clairbert ended up winning the gold medal yeah. but he had to fought, he had to fight to yeah. the nail to get by Leclerc yeah. and Leclerc knew that he was not to be on that podium yeah. but he got onto the podium yeah. that's what I want my young athletes to understand after you prepare there is something else you've got to prepare the mind as well as the body that race that silver medal had nothing to do with fitness yeah. with heart with cardiovascular capacity with technique yeah. with anaerobic capacity nothing it had to do with chad leclos saying whatever yeah. it took yeah. i'm getting on that podium oh, yeah. amazing yeah, you, your comment was brilliant though anil Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're Sports was... Max, Sports Max gets the best. Yeah. Yes, you, you, you're, you're absolutely brilliant. I must, I must tell you that. And he wasn't can... slow like Molasses. <laughs> can, can, can we talk some boxing now, gents? Uh, yes, yes. The, yeah. So the there were seven, science. seven Caribbean boxers were in in action today, and uh, four of them actually won. Rasheel Williams, the Bahamian, lost to Janias Jonas from Namibia. Colin Lewis from Guyana, he was beaten as well. And uh, Alston Rand from Antigua and Barbuda. He got a victory over Sierra Leone's John Brown. And here are the Caribbean wins now. Desmond Amsterdam from Guyana. He won 3-2 over Emil Richardson of New Zealand. Cameron Moses, the Grenadian, actually had a 5-0 win over Fui Tuji. And uh, Sam Hickey, the Scottish uh, boxer, in the light welterweight division, he actually defeated uh, Keegan Mortley of uh, St. Lucia. And Nigel Paul, the big super heavyweight from TNT, two-time Olympian, he won over Jean Attendi of Mauritius, Paul winning after the referee stopped the contest. That's what RSC stands for, referee stops contest. So uh, Nigel Paul has had some disappointments at the Olympics. Um, I know the COVID issue had affected a lot of people in their preparations for 2020 which was 2021, yeah, Olympics. 2021 yeah. but uh, even Rio I thought he was a little disappointed that he, he didn't do better so he got a result there Mortley the St. Lucian is one of three St. Lucians there Langier uh, Langelier from uh, St. Lucia and uh, there's also Regis uh, they both had been in England training for several weeks before the games uh, Mortley had his first outing today Regis and Langelier will box later on in the week. But Mortley was beaten by a pretty solid Scottish fighter, Sam Hickey. Uh, Hickey is a European Championship silver medalist this year. So Mortley found it, found it pretty tough. And uh, here's what he's told uh, Ricardo Chambers uh, just moments after he left the ring. Are we ready for that? Um, well, I fought really hard. I wanted to um, set the trend for Tim Senusha in the boxing. I really wanted to bring the victory, but when I heard the decision was unanimous, I thought it should have been closer uh, because I really fought hard. I thought I kept being the aggressor throughout. I didn't, um, you know, do the job and move. I really tried to, you know, bring the, the fight to him, but judge's decision fine up. You started out really aggressively. Um, as you said, you weren't the aggressor, but do you feel as if you lost some steam as the fight went on? Um, I wouldn't say I lost some steam. I'd say maybe I, from here and there, I'd maybe try and pick the shots, but when I realized it wasn't working out, I came back like the, the bullish kind of aggression. Well, this is my first ever. I've been unboxing for um, 13 years, and 
it's, it was a long journey. I finally got selected this year to be um, to take part in international international tournaments, and um, it's a bitter defeat for me because um, this year I told myself I wouldn't work. I just train morning, afternoon. I just train, but. And after this now, what's the outlook going forward? I mean, what do you do when well, these coming up games are all over? Train harder. Train harder. There's some um, Caribbean games in December, so I really look to make an impact there. Yeah, Higgin Mortley there from St. Lucia, losing 5 0 to the Scottish opponent and believing that he felt the fight was a lot closer than that score suggested. And we just saw Anil Roberts um, nodding his head when Mortley told Ricardo Chambers his next move is to come back, train harder train harder and get himself ready for the next assignment that's a fantastic attitude now i don't agree with him that the fight was closer all right he <laughs> fought a, a scottish guy 5-0 if it, it could have been 6-0 it could have been 6-0 but i am totally impressed with his attitude he is in he's he's just faced you have to you have to realize that he believed that he should win and i like that Mm. And he met a very skillful opponent who obliterated him. He's actually in a state of shock on top of getting some good cough in the head. And he's doing an interview. And yet he, he shows me some great attitude that I want in my athlete. Yes, I've just been decimated. Yes, my eye is swollen. What's next? Train harder. Work harder. Understand where I went wrong and how I can do better. I love that attitude. And yeah. You can understand the disappointment because reports out of the camp that they left uh, and went to the UK was that they were all training pretty well. Um, but sometimes when you train and you go into the adrenaline situation, the dynamics completely change and then boom. Also, yeah. as Lance knows, boxing is the luck of the draw. You may have trained and someone may suit you. Yes. But when the name comes up and yes. it's a different style yes. that you are not suited to, it's it's really the luck of the draw sometimes. Yeah. So he did great, but the boxing Caribbean boxers are doing great. The Guyanese mm. are doing tremendously yeah. well. Yeah, um, Amsterdam. The Guyanese had a win today. Austin Rand from Antigua and Barbuda also won. There was uh, Moses from Grenada winning, and TNT's Nigel Paul. So uh, the percentage of wins for the Caribbean boxers today uh, was higher than the percentage losses. Yeah, I know that's a good sign because you know for the. Last two decades or so, boxing had taken a dip in the Caribbean, and it's, it seems to be coming back now, which is quite encouraging. Yes. You know, so it's, it's nice to see, you know, the, the, coming from different countries as well, yeah. you know, making making a big step forward as yeah. well. This is a guy, and he's Amsterdam. Yes. And he looks, Amsterdam looks fit. He looks, you see where, where Leighton is correct, we've taken a dip in the sweet science. We are world champions, whether it's Trevor Burbick back in the 70s, for Jamaica, Simon Claude Brown. Noel, Leslie Brown. Tigers, uh, Stewart. Stewart coming up the road, and Guyana had two, one or two world champions. We fell apart. Now, the amateur boxing is the stable. Now, I don't want you staying in amateur till you're 40, for example, but I would like you to get maybe one or two Olympics, then get into the professional ranks because it's an opportunity for some athletes also to get themselves out they may not be academically inclined and yes. so on but their talent they can earn millions of dollars these athletes as especially another Ghanese, a uh, boxer who fought yesterday i Kevin think ali cock ali cock right. we saw him in the yeah, tokyo but, olympics yes. he looks better now yeah but anil ghana has always produced outstanding the boxers, boxers yeah. in yes. the past 20 years or so they've had four or five World champions. World champions. There was yes. Andrew Six Head Lewis, yep. um, vicious Vivian Harris, Wayne Big Truck Brathwit, even Brathwit, a woman yes. Gwendolyn O'Neill. She was a light heavyweight world champion, and Correct. of course Ghana has the record of having the only Olympic medalist in boxing from the Caribbean, Michael Paris, back in 1980. So the the Guyanese boxing culture is pretty strong, Very and strong. We, we can't be surprised when we see Ghana Guyanese boxers. Yeah. No, not at all. I think, and yeah. even during the well dip, here. even during the dip that I just mentioned, Ghana always maintained a certain level in their boxing. There's a strong yeah. culture there, yes, which I think is making the difference. I want people to take note. Ali, Co what what exactly is his name? Pronounced Kevin. 
Kevin Alicock. Kevin Alicock, yeah. write it down. I yes. think he's fighting tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. That youth man is impressive. He beat a, 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 an African boxer, but he's looking fast. He's yeah. confident. He has style. He has pizzazz. He is absolutely brilliant. So good. the Caribbean boxers doing yeah. well. Yeah, man, good okay. skill. When we come back from the break, though, we'll talk some netball. Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago were in action today. And we'll hear from Dame Florida, Flora Duffy's parents, the Commonwealth champion, the Olympic champion in triathlon, um, having her proud parents talk about her. Back in a moment. We're back on Commonwealth Tonight, our studio show, recapping what happened in the Commonwealth Games for 2022. And today we saw day three action. We're going to move quickly to some netball action. Jamaica's Sunshine Girls, 2-0 so far in uh, their pool. And uh, the Barbadians and Trinidad and Tobago, they were in action today, uh, both having losing results and um, disappointment for them. The uh, Barbadians were... A little better in their game against South Africa today. They were pretty bad against the Australians, but then the Aussies will make most teams look bad. And Trinidad and Tobago were up against Uganda today and uh, also found the Ugandans a little too hot to handle. And uh, a battle there between the champion or the top 10 teams in world netball at the moment. So after the Barbados outing against the South Africans, uh, the team manager, Nisha Cragwell, who is also president of the Barbados Netball Association, spoke to Ricardo Chambers on the Bayesian Gems effort. Assess today's performance for me against the South Africans in comparison to the opening match against Australia. Well, this was a better result. Um, we got our rest, we did our homework, and we came a bit stronger. And having gotten the first game jitters off, we expected our players to go hard. We're obviously a bit more comfortable with today's performance. I know you're not the coach, but just watching on today, do you feel like you were a little bit more patient in the attacking third and just trying to get the ball into the shooting? Arc? Yes, definitely. We were, were a bit more patient and the shorter pass worked for us. Um, we have the shorter players as well, so it made sense to keep the ball closer to the ground to make it a bit more difficult for the defenders. I have to ask though, because at one stage, I think early in the match, we were seeing a lot of long balls. At what stage did you kind of realize that this is really not the way to go? It really was not our game plan, so it just took for us to have a one break and for the coach to reinforce exactly what the game plan was, and then you should have seen a change in the transition of the ball. Tomorrow, it's going to be the Sunshine Girls. Yes. It's an old Caribbean match. Definitely. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so we are definitely going to be playing Jamaica tomorrow. And if you look at where they are ranked in the world, they are ranked fourth in comparison to our 12th position. But we are not... We are not um, intimidated by the positions we came here to play netball and we'll definitely be giving it our best shot tomorrow. Yeah, and one more, were you surprised that one, the crowd, because there was a massive crowd inside the arena tonight to watch the match against South Africa, um, and are you expecting anything similar for that Jamaica game tomorrow? Yes, I expect all of the netball games to have large crowds. We do normally have a huge following for netball at Commonwealth Games, but Majority of the times, the games are all sold out, so I don't expect tomorrow to be any different. So 91-36, the victory margin for South Africa over Barbados today. The margin was bigger for the Aussies in their victory over the Barbadians earlier on the weekend. And we are joined on the set now by Obadele Thompson, a bronze medalist in the 100 meters at the Sydney Olympics back in 2000. And uh, for several years, was the fastest junior in the world. He jointly held the world record for the 100 meters. And uh, at the moment, he is long retired and uh, he now plays a role of giving, giving his opinions and analysis on sport. And uh, Oba, disappointing for the Barbadians on the netball court today, but they were up against a team that is clearly better than they were. 
and they just didn't manage. How would you compare this effort to the one you saw against the Aussies? Uh, I think this was indeed a better effort. We heard that uh, they got some of the nervous jitters out of their system. That happens when it comes to major championships. But uh, I think I have a, a bigger concern, and it's something that I was discussing with Anil, and I think um, we really need to look at the fitness and conditioning of our players. Uh, this is a sport which requires agility, it requires quick reflexes, and it requires a lot of jumping and, and, and speed. And sometimes uh, when your conditioning is off, you're not able to perform at your best. And unfortunately, when I look at the fitness of our athletes, I think that is also leading to why they are not necessarily performing as well as they should. Uh, I know that during the pandemic, or I'm aware during the pandemic, they were not able to train as they wanted to. But at this level, being fit, being in condition to play the sport that you're going to play, when there are things such as the Commonwealth Games clearly on the calendar, it's important to do that. And I think that's something that management and coaching and the, the players need to really look at um, because I think we can be better in that area. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to mention, though, Oba, now that you talk about that and fitness, that speaks to the time that you spend in preparation. And I say that to say this, because a lot of the sports competitors in the Caribbean aren't full-time sports professionals, as against their opponents. Many of their opponents are full-time professional, in this case, netballers. The, the Aussie netballers are, are full pros, and, and uh, the New Zealanders and so on, and the South Africans, I would think so. One of your players, um, Tanisha Rockyaw, her day job is a news reporter at Voice of Barbados. I hear her reading news on, 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 on the radio quite often. So she has to share her time with preparing for netball. So isn't that part of the problem, that the infrastructure of sport in the Caribbean is not like the many of the opponents that we are facing? Yes, indeed, that is a problem. And, and for many administrators also, they are volunteers versus some of these countries where they might be paid positions. So that does play into the, the final equation of our performance. But still in terms of fitness, one thing I will say is that uh, in Barbados, it's crop over season. And you have regular people who have jobs that find a way to get in shape, to yeah, go I, and, and celebrate yeah. for, for one day or for seven days. Yeah. Whereas we have athletes who know that they're going to be representing the country at the highest levels, there has to be some level of sacrifice, yeah. which they are making, but that continued level of fitness. I'll, I'll say one more thing. One thing that I learned, I think, really too late in my career, um, and it was something that the American uh, Olympic champion in the 110 hurdles said to me, Alan Johnson, he said, the key is to never get out of shape. And I think that uh, attributed or you can attribute much of his success and longevity in the sport to never get no shape. And even, you mean even Collins, in the off-season. Even in the off-season. Yes. And I, I think sometimes what happens is the people uh, don't necessarily watch their diet and don't take uh, their consistently or don't approach it as, I need to be in shape at all times. Yes. And yes. when you fall off from that, yes. it's very hard yeah. to pick back up. Yeah. I, I can't agree with um, Oba there. Anil, because while I lived in Barbados, I was a, an intermittent gym gym person. And I, I do remember that when it got to like April or May, the gym attendance increased significantly as people wanted to get fit for crop over. I'm pretty certain that the carnival situation may be, may be the same there. But your thoughts on the Trinidad and Tobago performance today against Uganda, who are rated more closely to them. The gap between their rating and TNT's rating is much wider than the rating that South Africa has against Barbados. So uh, the Trinis would be a little disappointed that they weren't but able just to put to up a follow, better show. To follow on your conversation with Oba, and let me put the Trinis and the Bajans in the exact same position because the exact same problems exist that lead to us putting that product out on the court. In that interview with Ricardo Chambers and in your introduction, that illustrates the problem in all of my Caribbean territories. The president is also the manager. My Caribbean people, stop it. We need to take control of our emotions and our desires to 
benefit from perks of being in a position? Why is the president the manager? These are specific jobs that require different skills at different times. And this is not just Barbados. This is across the board. When I was the minister of sport in Trinidad and Tobago, I have a passion for netball and cricket because we were the best in the world. I immediately went to cabinet and got approval to move a semi-professional netball league where we would have had eight pro semi-professional teams, senior teams, down to junior teams who would have psychologists, physiotherapists, scientific coaching on an ongoing basis. We were going to build eight indoor air-conditioned netball courts to get Trinidad and Tobago back to the World Cup competition level of Jamaica and above. And all that was required for this, for our netballers to be paid to play netball, the government would have funded 80% of that bill. Yes. So therefore, our players would not have to do a full shift as a fire officer, police officer, and so on, yes. or a reporter. Do you know what was, was that stopped the program? The Netball Association needed to just sanction the program. And they refused to because for some unknown reason, they thought someone was coming to take over their little pond. We need to get serious. Our athletes deserve the opportunity to pre be prepared to go on the world stage and compete. To send athletes underprepared so that administrators could have a trip is an injustice to allow children, they're now adults, to get that thought of beating. For us, Trinidad and Tobago, to be shattered by Uganda lands. If I had Scooby here, I would talk to Scooby once again, just like when Bahamas drew with Trinidad and Tobago in football in World Cup qualifying. Mm. It is depressing. It is deplorable. And we must take stock and stop. Whatever we're doing now, it's all wrong. As a coach... I love when things are all wrong because you can easily improve. Start when things over. are going good, yeah. you get nervous because yeah. it's everything is going good. Yeah. What am I going to do? Yeah. How am I going to make the athlete better? But right now, netball in Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados is rock bottom. There is no further to go. Mm. A passion there from Anil Roberts because he's remembering when Trinidad and Tobago were world champions, joint world champions back in 1979 with uh, Jean Pierre and the company. Um, Flora Duffy is the reigning Olympic champion in triathlon. She's also the reigning Commonwealth champion, defending the title that she had won in the Gold Coast in Australia four years ago. Ricardo Chambers caught up with her parents. Of course, Flora had a very tough build-up to her Commonwealth title defense, COVID-19, twice since January. But she was splendid and retained her title and her parents are very proud of her. Donald Oliver did the interview with uh, Flora Duffy's parents. Representing the winner, Flora Duffy! Flora continues to bloom. The Olympic champion has become the Commonwealth champion. And on a course which was about half the size of the trek she took in Tokyo, the Bermudan came out on top. Her parents, Maria and Charlie Duffy, who were unable to make the trip to Tokyo because of the COVID restrictions, were on hand to celebrate with her in Birmingham. Unfortunately, we couldn't be in Tokyo, neither could anybody else. So this is really, really amazing. You know, Bermuda's immensely proud of what she's done and long may it continue. We're just so thankful and grateful. And Not very often we see parents analyze the performances of their children. Uh, when Flora, when she went through the second transition, she sprinted to get in and out as quick as possible. And once she built up that lead over Georgia, and that was the end of the that was the end of the race. So, but it's a fantastic race. 55 minutes for a, a sprint triathlon is unbelievable. They are glad to now be celebrating with her. I am, um, you know, the we did miss the Olympics in Tokyo, but. To be honest, we were in our local pub with all our friends and, you know, Tokyo was kind of an empty place with no atmosphere, so there was plenty where we were and plenty of shots, especially this one. And, um, you know, we're, uh, sometimes, sometimes I'm just, I just think, and I just thought before, how did this happen? Because Mary and I are 
reasonably athletic, but not, not this. Birmingham 2022 is the end of Flora's Commonwealth Games chapter. As far as her parents are concerned, her legacy is cemented. Continue to be over the moon and amazed by Flora, as as Bermuda does, uh, yeah, in a lot of the world. And she is the greatest female triathlete ever. Oh, it's Charlie, Charlie Duffy's a riot, is he? Mm. With, with beer, with beer in hand. Flora Duffy, one of only two Bermudans to win Olymp win Commonwealth Games gold. She has won two. And uh, Clarence Saunders had won a gold medal in the high jump back in 1990 at the um, Auckland Games in New Zealand when Jamaican Merle Naughty was a sprint double champion there. So Flora Duffy winning two of three gold medals the Bermudians have in Commonwealth Games history. Um, uh, we go to a break, I think. And, and when we come back, we put the wrap on the show and look ahead to some of the big events lined up for Monday. We're back on Commonwealth Tonight, our studio show, recapping what happened in the Commonwealth Games for 2022. And today we saw day three action. We're going to move quickly to some netball action. Jamaica's Sunshine Girls 2-0 so far in uh, their pool. And uh, the Barbadians and Trinidad and Tobago, they were in action today, uh, both having losing results and um, disappointment for them. The uh, Barbadians were... A little better in their game against South Africa today. They were pretty bad against the Australians, but then the Aussies will make most teams look bad. And Trinidad and Tobago were up against Uganda today and uh, also found the Ugandans a little too hot to handle. And uh, a battle there between the champion or the top 10 teams in world netball at the moment. So after the Barbados outing against the South Africans, uh, the team manager, Nisha Cragwell, who is also president of the Barbados Netball Association, spoke to Ricardo Chambers on the Bayesian Gems effort. Assess today's performance for me against the South Africans in comparison to the opening match against Australia. Well, this was a better result. Um, we got our rest, we did our homework, and we came a bit stronger. And having gotten the first game jitters off, we expected our players to go hard. We're obviously a bit more comfortable with today's performance. I know you're not the coach, but just watching on today, do you feel like you were a little bit more patient in the attacking third and just trying to get the ball into the shooting? Arc? Yes, definitely. We were, were a bit more patient and the shorter pass worked for us. Um, we have the shorter players as well, so it made sense to keep the ball closer to the ground to make it a bit more difficult for the defenders. I have to ask though, because at one stage, I think early in the match, we were seeing a lot of long balls. At what stage did you kind of realize that this is really not the way to go? It really was not our game plan, so it just took for us to have a one break and for the coach to reinforce exactly what the game plan was, and then you should have seen a change in the transition of the ball. Tomorrow, it's going to be the Sunshine Girls. Yes. It's an old Caribbean match. Definitely. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so we are definitely going to be playing Jamaica tomorrow. And if you look at where they are ranked in the world, they are ranked fourth in comparison to our 12th position. But we are not... We are not um, intimidated by the positions we came here to play in that ball and we'll definitely be giving it our best shot tomorrow. Yeah, and one more, were you surprised that one, the crowd, because there was a massive crowd inside the arena tonight to watch the match against South Africa, um, and are you expecting anything similar for that Jamaica game tomorrow? Yes, I expect all of the netball games to have large crowds. We do normally have a huge following for netball at Commonwealth Games. Most Majority of the times, the games are all sold out, so I don't expect tomorrow to be any different. So 91.36, the victory margin for South Africa over Barbados today. The margin was bigger for the Aussies in their victory over the Barbadians earlier on the weekend. And we are joined on the set now by Obadele Thompson, a bronze medalist in the 100 meters at the Sydney Olympics back in 2000. 
and uh, for several years was the fastest junior in the world. He jointly held the world record for the 100 meters, and uh, at the moment, he is long retired, and uh, he now plays a role of giving, giving his opinions and analysis on sport. And uh, Oba, disappointing for the Barbadians on the netball court today, but they were up against a team that is clearly better than they were, and they just didn't manage. How would you compare this effort to the one you saw against the Aussies? Uh, I think this was indeed a better effort. We heard that uh, they got some of the nervous jitters out of their system. That happens when it comes to major championships. But uh, I think I have a, a bigger concern, and it's something that I was discussing with Anil, and I think um, we really need to look at the fitness and conditioning of our players. Uh, this is a sport which requires agility. It requires quick reflexes. And it requires a lot of jumping and, and, and speed. And sometimes uh, when your conditioning is off, you're not able to perform at your best. And unfortunately, when I look at the fitness of our athletes, I think that is also leading to why they are not necessarily performing as well as they should. Uh, I know that during the pandemic, or I'm aware during the pandemic, they were not able to train as they wanted to. But at this level... Being fit, being in condition to play the sport that you're going to play when there are things such as the Commonwealth Games clearly on the calendar, it's important to do that. And I think that's something that management and coaching and the, the players need to really look at um, because I think we can be better in that area. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to mention, though, Oba, now that you talk about that and fitness, that speaks to the time that you spend in preparation. And I say that to say this, because a lot of the sports competitors in the Caribbean aren't full-time sports professionals, as against their opponents. Many of their opponents are full-time professional, in this case, netballers. The, the Aussie netballers are, are full pros, and, and uh, the New Zealanders and so on, and the South Africans, I would think so. One of your players, um, Tanisha Rockyaw, her day job is a news reporter at Voice of Barbados. I hear her reading news on, 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 on the radio quite often. So she has to share her time with preparing for netball. So isn't that part of the problem, that the infrastructure of sport in the Caribbean is not like the many of the opponents that we are facing? Yes, indeed, that is a problem. And, and for many administrators also, they are volunteers versus some of these countries where they might be paid positions. So that does play into the, the final equation of our performance. But still, in terms of fitness, one thing I will say is that uh, in Barbados, it's crop over season. And you have regular people who have jobs that find a way to get in shape, to yeah, go I, and, and celebrate yeah. for, for one day or for seven days. Yeah. Whereas... We have athletes who know that they're going to be representing the country at the highest levels. There has to be some level of sacrifice, yeah. which they are making, but that continued level of fitness. I'll, I'll say one more thing. One thing that I learned, I think, really too late in my career, um, and it was something that the American uh, Olympic champion in the 110 hurdles said to me, Alan Johnson, he said, the key is to never get out of shape. And I think that uh, attributed or you can attribute much of his success and longevity in the sport to never get no shape. And even, you mean even Collins, in the off season, even in the off season. Yes. And I, I think sometimes what happens is the people uh, don't necessarily watch their diet and don't take uh, their consistently or don't approach it as I need to be in shape at all times. Yes. And yeah. when you fall off from that, yes. it's very hard yeah. to pick back up. Yeah. I, I can't agree with um, Oba there. Anil, because while I lived in Barbados, I was a, an intermittent gym gym person. And I, I do remember that when it got to like April or May, the gym attendance increased significantly as people wanted to get fit for crop over. I'm pretty certain that the carnival situation may be, may be the same there. But your thoughts on the Trinidad and Tobago performance today against Uganda, who are rated more closely to them. The gap between their rating and TNT's rating is much wider than the rating that South Africa has against Barbados. So uh, the Trinis would be a little disappointed that they weren't but able just to put to up a follow, better show. To follow on your conversation with Oba, and let me put the Trinis and the Bajans in the exact same position because the exact same problems exist 
that lead to us putting that product out on the court. In that interview with Ricardo Chambers and in your introduction, that illustrates the problem in all of my Caribbean territories. The president is also the manager. My Caribbean people, stop it. We need to take control of our emotions and our desires to benefit from perks of being in a position. Why is the president the manager? These are specific jobs that require different skills at different times. And this is not just Barbados. This is across the board. When I was the minister of sport in Trinidad and Tobago, I have a passion for netball and cricket because we were the best in the world. I immediately went to cabinet and got approval to move a semi-professional netball league where we would have had eight pro semi-professional teams, senior teams, down to junior teams, who would have psychologists, physiotherapists, scientific coaching on an ongoing basis. We were going to build eight indoor air-conditioned netball courts to get Trinidad and Tobago back to the World Cup competition level of Jamaica and above. And all that was required for this, for our netballers to be paid to play netball the government would have funded 80 percent of that bill yes. so therefore our players would not have to do a full shift as a fire officer police officer and so on yes. or a reporter do you know what was was that stopped the program the netball association needed to just sanction the program and they refused to because for some unknown reason, they thought someone was coming to take over their little pond. We need to get serious. Our athletes deserve the opportunity to pre be prepared to go on the world stage and compete. To send athletes underprepared so that administrators could have a trip is an injustice to allow children, they're now adults, to get that thought of beating. For us, Trinidad and Tobago, to be shattered by Uganda lands. If I had Scooby here, I would talk to Scooby once again, just like when Bahamas drew with Trinidad and Tobago in football in World Cup qualifying. Mm. It is depressing. It is deplorable. And we must take stock and stop whatever we're doing now. It's all wrong. As a coach, I love when things are all wrong because you can easily improve. Start when things over. are going good, yeah. you get nervous because yeah. it's everything is going good. Yeah. What am I going to do? Yeah. How am I going to make the athlete better? But right now, netball in Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados is rock bottom. There is no further to go. Mm. A passion there from Anil Roberts because he's remembering when Trinidad and Tobago were world champions, joint world champions back in 1979 with uh, Jean Pierre and the company. Um, Flora Duffy is the reigning Olympic champion in triathlon. She's also the reigning Commonwealth champion, defending the title that she had won in the Gold Coast in Australia four years ago. Ricardo Chambers caught up with her parents. Of course, Flora had a very tough build up to her Commonwealth title defense, COVID-19, twice since January, but she was splendid and retained her title and her parents are very proud of her. Donald Oliver did the interview with uh, Flora Duffy's parents. Representing Bermuda, Flora Duffy! Flora continues to bloom. The Olympic champion has become the Commonwealth champion. And on a course which was about half the size of the trek she took in Tokyo, the Bermudan came out on top. Her parents, Maria and Charlie Duffy, who were unable to make the trip to Tokyo because of the COVID restrictions, were on hand to celebrate with her in Birmingham. Unfortunately, we couldn't be in Tokyo, neither could anybody else. So this is really, really amazing. You know, Bermuda's immensely proud of what she's done and long may it continue. We're just so thankful and grateful. And Not very often we see parents analyze the performances of their children. Uh, when Flora when she went through the second transition she sprinted to get in and out as quick as possible and once she built up that lead over Georgia and that was the end of the that was the end of the race so but it's a fantastic race 55 minutes for a, a sprint triathlon is unbelievable they are glad to now be celebrating with her I am um, you know 
the we did miss the Olympics in Tokyo, but to be honest, we were in our local pub with all our friends. And you know, Tokyo was kind of an empty place with no atmosphere, so there was plenty where we were, and plenty of shots, especially this one. And um, you know, we're uh, sometimes. Sometimes I'm just, I just think, and I just thought before, how did this happen? Because Maria and I are reasonably athletic, but not, not this. Birmingham 2022 is the end of Flora's Commonwealth Games chapter. As far as her parents are concerned. Her legacy is cemented. Continue to be over the moon and amazed by Flora, as as Bermuda does, yeah, in a lot of the world. And she is the greatest female triathlete ever. Oh, Charlie, Charlie Duffy's a riot, is he? <laughs> with, with beer, with beer in hand. Flora Duffy, one of only two Bermudans to win Olymp win Commonwealth Games gold. She has won two. And uh, Clarence Saunders had won a gold medal in the high jump back in 1990 at the um, Auckland Games in New Zealand when Jamaican Merle Naughty was a sprint double champion there. So Flora Duffy winning two of three gold medals the Bermudians have in Commonwealth Games history. Um, uh, we go to a break, I think. And, and when we come back, we put the wrap on the show and look ahead to some of the big events lined up for Monday. <laughs> 